I'm zombie teacher. I'm reading up teacher's brains. Am I alive? I'm eating. I'm moving. But can I do the other things that make you alive? Let's find her. Zombie teacher, you're not alive. Okay, so right now we're going to go down our list of characteristics of life and see what makes something living versus non-living. You ready? Let's go. So here's our list of characteristics of life that we're going to use. Now, you may see this list with the qualities in a different order or some of them combined, some of them split apart. The essential part is knowing how to determine if something is living or non-living based on these general ideas. So you don't need to memorize the order or memorize there are eight characteristics of life, but just go ahead and know these qualities are very important in determining if something is living or non-living. So let's go through them one by one. First of all, we have cells. All living things are made of cells. All living things are organized. They have levels of organization. All living things reproduce. Now that's going to be sexually or asexually, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, little bit. All living things use DNA, the universal genetic code. All living things grow and develop. All living things use energy, and we're going to call this metabolism. All living things respond to the environment, and all living things use homeostasis. They have an internal balance that they have to regulate. And all living things evolve over time. So let's start with cells. Cells are the basic functional unit of life. So all living things are made of cells, but cells can be very different and specialized. So different living things have different types of cells. A sperm cell, for example, is going to be very different from a red blood cell. Those are two different types of cells with two different functions. So they're going to look differently and have different sizes. Cells can range in size from very, very small bacteria that are only one micrometer long to huge egg cells. Cells are highly organized and very complex. They're made of organelles with other different functions to perform the cell's many activities. Now living things are also very organized. Organization is one of our characteristics of life. So when we look at living things and how they're organized, we can start at the very bottom at the basic functional unit of matter, which is the atom. Now, when you have a lot of atoms put together, you can get molecules. Atoms and molecules are not living things. So when we're talking about atoms and molecules. Those are more things that chemists and physicists will study. When you get up to the level of the cell, with lots of molecules and organelles put together, that's our very basic unit of life. Up from the cell and beyond, we get to all the living things. So, after the cell, if you have lots of cells put together, you can get a tissue. Different tissues make up organs. Several organs together will get you your organ system, and many organ systems put together will give you an organism. Now, with lots of organisms put together, you can get a population. A population is a group of the same species of organisms who are living together in the same area. Now, several populations can make a community, and after community, you can have an ecosystem. Now, after that, we move up to the largest level of organization we have here on Earth, which is the biosphere, the sum of all the ecosystems on Earth, or the area on Earth that has life. So. Anything down from the biosphere all the way to the cell is considered a living level of organization. And biologists can study anything from the cellular level all the way up to the biosphere. And the biosphere is the largest, most complicated level of organization. So, reproduction. Now, in biology, there's two ways to reproduce, sexually and asexually. And the difference is very simple. In asexual reproduction, you start with one cell to divide into two daughter cells. Those two daughter cells are identical copies of the parent cell. In sexual reproduction, you start with two cells that each give half of their genetic material to create one new cell. So, asexual, one to two, sexual, two to one. And with sexual reproduction, we're going to get a lot more diversity because we're combining the genes of two different cells. With asexual reproduction, we go from one to one. It's an exact copy. There's no change. Now, all living things will grow, which is an increase in mass, and develop, which is a change in organization. So, plants, animals, bacteria, anything that is alive will grow and develop. So, 
If you look at an insect, when it's a little tiny larva, it's going to grow and change its organization, change its structure, and become the adult. That's the development, and at the same time, it's getting larger. That's the growth. All living things are going to respond to the environment. If we have something like a plant that bends towards the sunlight, that's responding to a stimuli. That's responding to the environment. All living things do that. If you turn on the light when a cockroach is in the room and the cockroach runs away, he's also responding to the environment. If you prick somebody, they're going to jerk away. That's responding to the environment. All living things do this from the microorganisms all the way up to us. All living things are going to use energy, which means all living things are going to metabolize. Every function in a cell uses energy, so all living things need to take in energy and use it to function. All living things use homeostasis. Now, homeostasis Homeostasis is responding to the environment and keeping an internal balance. So as humans use homeostasis in a lot of ways, whether it's body temperature, pH, water regulation, all those things involve us regulating our internal environments so it's different from the outside. All living things are going to evolve. So an individual can evolve, but a population of living things together can change over time and turn into a new species. So, we're going to talk a lot about this when we study evolution, but after a while, a group of individuals can have genetic traits that differ from the other group and create a new species that can no longer interbreed. That's speciation and that's evolution. All living things use the universal genetic code DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Say it again, deoxyribonucleic acid. So this very special molecule is going to contain all our genetic information, it exists in every single one of our cells, and it's going to control our heredity. So whatever we pass down to our children is contained in our DNA. The diversity of life is huge. We can have organisms that start at the micro level, microorganisms you can only see with a microscope, like this little water bear tardigrade guy, or you can have things that range at the macro level, things that are so huge they look like multiple organisms put together. For example, we have the Pando forest, which is a bunch of aspen trees connected together by a root system, and it's actually all one organism. Some t scientists say it's the largest living organism on Earth. Other people say there is one sequoia tree called General Sherman that is the, currently the largest living organism on earth that is one mass. So I want you to look up tonight, do a little research, and find out what the smallest living organism on earth might be. Now different sources might say different things, so look it up, cite your source, and we'll talk about it in class tomorrow. <laughs> Let's talk about our characteristics again. So what makes something living versus non-living? Well we went through these things. Cells organize, reproduce, DNA, grow and develop, use energy, respond to the environment, homeostasis, and evolution. For tonight, what I want you to do is go through the characteristics of life that we've just discussed and use your computer as an example. I want you to go through every single characteristic and say if the computer applies. Does your computer grow and develop? Is your computer made of cells? Does your computer change? Is it made of DNA? All those things and see if any of them apply. Now. Also for homework, I want you to be looking up that smallest living organism on Earth. And lastly, I want you to find me a few examples of homeostasis in the human. So, how do we humans regulate our internal balance? What are some things we do to maintain our homeostasis? Those are your three things I want to see tomorrow in your notes. Have a great night, guys. Zombie teacher.